the joys of being a woman in the STEM world. I have a great guest for you today. I have Sarah Freeman with me. And Sarah and I go back a few years in a really interesting way. But what I know about Sarah is that she's eclectic and has great interest and is very talented. So we're going to talk about women in technology today because she is in that space. And I want to speak about women in technology today. And I want to hear what Sarah has to say, because I think it's really important that we look at the disparity happening in our world head on and see what we can do as women and as men to further the technological advances to be a positive, beneficial influence here on earth. So Sarah is my willing guest as we talk about very important matters. So get your notebook and pen to take notes and get your favorite drink and join me as we talk to Sarah today. Welcome, Sarah, to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy that you're, you're here with me today. And my first question is, I'm really interested in what first attracted you to the whole technology space? Um, I was in I was in college. I was a chemistry person. I was a science geek, and nobody could understand why a girl would be in science. I could understand it because I was doing it. So, but how did it happen for you that you you became enthralled with this whole technology part of the world? I love this question. I actually bought my first computer ever about three more three years before I started in the technology space. And I got involved because I was in sales. Um, as told by my family, I should be in sales because I'm a talker. I'm a people person. I, I'm intuitive. I'm like, okay, I'll go into sales. And I was, I was transitioning. I bought a computer and I, I think I did like monster.com or whatever it was back then. And I found this job and I'm like, well, this looks like fun. You need a degree. I don't have a degree. No problem. I'm going to try it anyway. And I applied and I made it to the first interview and I walked in the door and, and I, I well, in the parking lot, there's Porsches and Corvettes and just all these really cool cars, BMWs. And I'm walking and I'm like, okay, this, this, these people must be doing pretty well. And I walk in the door and there's some crazy music playing on the overhead and you can hear the excitement on the sales floor. You could hear everybody talking and having a good time, 100% men. So I was the only woman in there. I was the only one in there to interview. And I just thought, wow, this, this looks like a lot of fun. And I, I could do this. It's, it's selling. It, at that point, it was just selling more than it was technology. Right. And as I got hired on there, I wanted to understand what it was that I was selling, which was networking hardware, which is the, the fabric of what connects the internet. And I was like, and it, it, after a few years, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not selling technology. I'm selling human connection. Without these parts and pieces that were going through my hands and my orders, the world would not be connected. And that was just kind of, for me, it was like a, a blessing and a gift and also my curiosity. I have to know how things work. So I, I dove in. If I sold something I didn't know what it was or what it did, I had to immediately research and find out what this does, what it is, how it affects you know the network, everything. Mm -hmm. And I just kept going further and further and further. And I'm 17 years in. I just had my 17-year anniversary. Oh, that's amazing. See, in the gift world, we call that an intellectual overexcitability, where we get excited by something and we dive down the rabbit hole until we're done with that rabbit hole or we expand the rabbit hole or whatever. And so, of course, that's how you did it. You mentioned that you're intuitive. And how does intuition play a factor in your technology world? Do they go together? Or do you have to like separate them? How does it work for you? Because a lot of people that I've talked to said, we can't be intuitive. and and into technology and sciences. And I, I disagree. I think it's a vital part, but what's your take on it? Yeah, I disagree with that as well. It is, it's part of my everyday life. So it's hard to delineate what would be non-intuitive. It goes with everything. Every, most of what I do is have conversations with people and I get very direct with them. I will tell them that their baby is ugly. You know, if you're having, if you don't have proper cyber awareness or cyber resiliency or cybersecurity, if you have a bad network, if you, you're cut, you know, there's, there's things that you can happen in your business that can help you along. I can see that from five miles away. I can see that from a 30,000 foot view versus where the person that's in it can only see what's in front of their face. And, and it really helps in the conversations. It helps with it, like my intuitiveness to take you up on this offer for the podcast interview. I thought, you know what, this is going to be pretty cool and interesting. 
I'm going to follow that path. And that really is what leads and drives most of what I do is I'll, I'll see something, I'll see a story about a company or I'll see something and I'll, I'll somehow already know with that intuitiveness, I'll somehow already know right. what to talk about when calling. I mean, I could talk all day on that. That's <laughs> really, great. It's that knowingness, like, like that day that I put out there, I wanted somebody to do the show with me. It was a knowingness. You know, because yeah. if anybody would have said, oh, yeah, that you're going to find it that way, I would say, well, probably not, but okay. Well, but yeah, I knew, I knew it would happen that way. Yeah. And I would have, I found myself having these intuitive moments of what I call big deals. And I would start, I would text my friends and say, pray to the big deal gods. I can feel this. I can see this coming. I don't know what it's going to look like when it gets here, but I know there's something on the horizon that I'll be working on within the next year. That's a, that's a pretty sizable opportunity. And I always, and, and knowing that and having that, it's always so I know when that door opens to walk through it. Yes. Oh, that's excellent. So do the men around you in this technology space, are they intuitive too, or do they admit to it? Or, or, do you, or how does that work? Or do you notice? No, they do not admit to it. I find it funny that I, I'll talk about manifestation. I'll talk about intuition in conversations with suppliers, with, with other, you know, with technology people, with network engineers. And sometimes I get that cross-eyed look like, oh, she's a little floo-foo. And sometimes, a lot of the times I'm seeing more now in the past year than ever before, people leaning in. They want to know more about what I'm talking about because manifestation, spirituality, and, and everything that goes along and is, encompasses that intuitiveness is really on the forefront of society right now. So I feel I see people leaning in. It just happened at a, a recently at a Christmas party where I ended up, I started to have a conversation with one person. I ended up with four additional people, uh, men coming in to tune in to listen to what I was talking about. So I've, I've really seen a shift in, again, in the past year from that cross eyed, like, whatever. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Look to, okay, maybe this person has something to say and I, I should be listening. Oh, that's amazing. And I'll bet that makes your work feel different to you from getting all the cross-eyed looks to people being interested. Yeah, it definitely does. It warms my heart to know that people are, are more open now than they were before. And people are more open to having women in technology than in the field than they were before. And that was going to be my next question is, how has that been for you? Have you noticed any kind of gender biases or any kinds of issues in your blonde? So now you're a blonde female in the technology world. And so how has that ride been? Have you noticed a lot of challenges or do people just kind of accept you or how's it, how's no. it been? No, it hasn't been. So one of my favorite points in my story is there was a, an international trade association that formed the same year I stepped into the technology world. And I was actually part of the formation of that trade association, writing bylaws, ethics, et cetera. And we had our first annual meeting one year after a year and a half after I started in, in, in this space. And I remember walking into this meeting. I did not know anybody. It was in Las Vegas. I did not know anybody. But the first thing I noticed that I was one of four women in the room and there were over 200 people there. Wow. And so that was, that was a novelty at the time to most people. But then I was an intelligent, powerful woman. And over time in that portion of my career through the previous businesses kind of became, I don't want to say a demise, but it became a little bit of an issue. Stepping to the table, I became the, um, I became involved in the board of directors for that trade association. And I, of course, they, I started as secretary because that was the role that opened up. And I moved into vice, I went from secretary directly to vice president role. And I started stating my intentions about, that I would like to become president of the association. I'd like to see some changes made. And if I'm, if I'm at the helm, I can help drive some of these changes. And that didn't go over well. It, there's a lot of boys clubs in that space, they would go golf trips together. They would vacation together. They would do these things. And that, the women were never invited. But what's interesting also, at the, the last year that I went to a meeting and the last year I was involved with that so association, there were 43 women in the room. And I was like, wow, I got up on stage to do a presentation and looking over the crowd, it was like, wow, because in 2005, there were four of us in this room. And one of them was there. What do you call it? She was just directing the the she meeting. Like she was, she was, meeting. Yeah, she's a facilitator for the meeting. So there was really only three of us that were actually in technology. And to look out over the room and see 43 women in technology, in sales roles, in management roles was just 
amazing to me. And now, now that I've moved over into an advisor position, I'm seeing more and more women in the role of CIO. I'm seeing more women in cybersecurity. One, one of my best friends just got her master's in cybersecurity and she's going for her PhD. And so I'm seeing that shift and I'm, and I'm hoping that I'm part of that shift. I'm hoping that I'm helping thrive that. And I do some of that in my in the nonprofit work that I do, helping minorities and women get into the technology field and getting over that stigma. Right. So what do you think is the biggest obstacle so far? Like it's changed a lot for the better, but when you look at it, what do you see as the biggest obstacle that we could all help with to bring that obstacle so it's not so big in the world? Yourself. Um, yourselves. I had an opportunity. Um, I used to have, uh, I used to run a warehouse business. So I shipped parts all over the world and I was hiring an intern and I, I sent the application to only a women in technology group at the local college saying I'm hiring an intern and nobody was applying. And I kept asking the manager of that group, like what's happening here. And they said, Oh, you'll only pick a man. I said, I didn't actually send this out to any men. Why aren't these people applying? They automatically put themselves in a role, as, even as me as a woman that is hiring for a paid internship. They still put themselves in that role of, I would choose a man over them. And that's really when my passion really hit home and said, okay, I have to do something to change this. This, this we cannot continue forward with that vision. Right. So everybody's so enculturated into the fact that you're going to pick a man first that the women kind of rule themselves out before mm-hmm. they even have the opportunity to step in. Yeah. So so what we're saying here is belief systems. We have to really go within and start shifting our own belief systems about our own value and yeah. our own worthiness and our own capability and release the idea of assigning motive to the other person. Right, exactly. Yeah, I like that. And I want to add to that. There's another part of that. And again, I'm seeing this shift So as the younger generations come up, there are more women that code, there's more women in technology, there's more women that are gamers, and so they're more accepting. And so I think that the the community is just naturally moving in that direction. But if there's something that I can say to the men that listen to this, be more open to the women that are in technology. This isn't a competition. Nobody's smarter than anybody else in the room. We all have our own knowledge sets. So we all bring something to the table and just be open to that. And please don't say, oh, you're a woman in technology? As if that's a surprise. Right, exactly. And and it, you don't have to have that look anymore. And, you know, I'm a big one on yes and and inclusion, like the more the better in the sense of all the diverse ideas and autobiographies and worldviews only add, especially when you're a leader in a, in a technology world, or I work with a lot of science people and a lot of musicians and they're leaders. And the more is better when you really allow that creativity that genius to show up, yeah, you know, in, in all of its cool ways, whether it's coming through a, a man or a woman, is it not as relevant as people might want to think it is? Right. Exactly. I agree with that. You know, so if, the, if there's a young girl out here listening to us, or maybe a mother of a young girl who is interested in technology, but isn't really sure what to do, or if it's, it's even okay, what would you say to that younger girl, that teenager or early twenties girl that is flirting with it, but isn't quite sure. What can I do to support you? Ooh. What what tools do you need? What can I do to support you? And also, look, there's a lot of applications, like apps that you can get on your phone to learn how to code, to build games, to build basic websites, and to just get your feet wet to see if you really like that and understand it. Technology isn't just about sitting behind a desk and typing code into a computer. Technology is everything. If everywhere that you look in your house, there is a piece of technology. Technology connects the world. So just just play and dabble and find what interests you and use those free resources because there's so many out there. Right. And then if you're wondering and you're not sure, check the show notes for Sarah's LinkedIn page and you can message her and she'll help you if you just absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. She, she will support you. And, and you're bringing a smile to my face because... I was just speaking to my social media strategist, Victoria Rose, who interviewed her recently on this show about about realizing you're gifted. Like, what's that about? And the other day I said, so what have you been doing over the Christmas holidays and over the holidays and things? And she says, well, I'm learning code because it's something to do. It's something fun to learn. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I celebrate that. That is fantastic. And she's a classical pianist and teaches music and does social media and does all of these really cool things. And she was teaching herself code because she just wanted to learn, learn about it. 
And I think that's what you're speaking to is follow that curiosity in people. Yeah. And that when you're curious, go down that a little bit and check it out. And there's there's always avenues to to see if you like it or not. You know, yeah. like and and I think that's a really good way. And you can use your intuition for how does this feel? Exactly. And you don't know until you try. Exactly. I agree with that hundred percent. Like I love some technology things and it's fun to play with, but I know myself and I know that if I go too far, I'll lose track of time. And then pretty soon I won't, you know, it'll be a big mess and that won't be a good thing. So I'm, I know where my limits lie and I so appreciate people who have gone down the rabbit hole further than myself. Can I, I speak to them a little bit? bit? Yeah. And I, I would like to, you know, it, you just reminded me of something that one of my prior business partners, uh, teenage daughter asked me one time, she said, how do you know to, how to do all these things? And because something would need to get done, whether it was a piece of construction, whether it was fitness, whether it was technology, whatever it was, an art project, I would just say, sure, I can do it. And so she questioned that one day and I said, I don't, I just try. And if I can't, then, then I find out that I couldn't do it. That's a very short list of things that I found out that I cannot do, but I just go ahead and first, like, sure, I'll try it. And I think that's really a key to my success in me finding out what I love to do in life. Oh, I think that's so true. I don't know. You probably remember this. Remember, it was several years ago, the audio platform that came out for a while, Blab? No, I don't. It, I can't remember who did it. it. was Periscope was big at the time, and it was at that time frame. And I was a first adopter. I'm like, oh, I want to do that. And I started doing all these little rooms and all these little things. And then it went away. And I'm like, okay, now I'll do the next thing. And I love that that curiosity is in my spirit. And I just check out different things. Because that's how I've learned and honed into like what really, really floats my boat and what really lights that inner fire in me. And it, some of it's different than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And you don't, again, you don't know until you try. Right, exactly. So what, looking forward, let's look forward a minute here. And your work has a great impact. And what kind of impact would you like to see your work having, including your nonprofit passion projects that you might want to share about what do you see as the future impact of, of the things you're doing today? How, how are these things going to move forward? Well, there's a few things. First, I'm on a mission of profit with a purpose. So I used to be profit and then purpose. And I would send money to nonprofits, to charities. I would go with the Habitat for Humanity once or twice a year and help build houses. And that was great. But I came to, I came to this realization of I can profit with purpose. And that's, that's what this mission is. So I'm connected to a lot of um, technology suppliers. That's what I do. I advise on, on which platforms to choose, et cetera. So that actually goes hand in hand with the nonprofits that I work with that we're helping to close what, what's the digital divide or digital inequity. And what I would like to see happen with that is to see every child in a Title I school, every child have access to a computer and have internet at home so that they can get online and not start at behind the rest of their class and not start behind the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see adults and college, outside of college students in technology, you don't really need college. You need, you need your certifications. In order to get those certifications and also to get a job, you need hands-on experience. So what I do in the nonprofit world, the, the several that I work with, is, is I'm actually creating it still, is creating an ecosystem where people can be involved. They get hands-on experience working with computers on more of the adult and older teenage range. And then we take those computers and we hand them to students in Title I schools so they can take them home, working on that connectivity. And what I would like to see by the time I retire, I would like to see a more evenness in terms of men and women in the technology world. And I would like to see more technology classes offered in the schools, because really this is where we're going. We don't, you know, we have the, we have all the basic subjects we have, and there are some that are, that are available, but not really, you know, not what we, what we really need to prepare these students for the world of technology in 10 years from now. And waiting until you're an adult or have to figure it out way later. It's like, it, it's just, it always feels like you're playing catch up. It makes much more sense yeah. to educate people earlier in an equitable manner. So I, I love those projects and I love how they have that interconnectivity. That's yeah. Cool. That's beautiful. I just, I love it. So now I have a few other like random questions that I, my intuition is saying, and that I'm just curious about okay. <laughs> uh, what kinds of things do you do for fun? 
Because, I mean, your brain is, you know, technology that's very cerebral, but you're also intuitive. That's very ethereal. So what does Sarah do for fun? I read a lot. I am addicted to personal and professional development. So everything that I read has to do with personal and professional development and other people's stories within that. So that is the main thing of what I do. I love puzzles. But I'm one of those people, if I start a puzzle, I have to finish it. I will dream about it. I wake up thinking about the puzzle until that last piece is in. I do random art projects, as you see with the hilarious painting behind me. Um, Just ways to give outlet to my creativity. But I also love being outside. So I hike, rollerblade, anything that I can possibly do outside. If this desk right now could be outside, I would be very happy. A little cold here right now for that, but if it could be, I would be very happy just working outside and being outside. Oh, there was another thing, one that I thought of just a minute ago. I like to read reports and dive into statistics, different things, and go down. What really, really, really excites me is when we talk about these rabbit holes, I'll see something that I don't know or understand, and then down the rabbit hole I go. I have to research it, I want to know about it, I will get books on it, I will connect with people that are in that space, just to have an understanding of it, just because it doesn't mean I'm going to do anything with it. I just like to know things. Yeah. So I guess, I guess knowledge is fun for me. Oh yes. I, I totally am with you on that. It's like, I love to learn things I people go, why are you learning that? I go, cause I want to learn it. Right. That's good right. Enough, right. I just want to learn it. It's, it's really fun. So will you um, share with everybody the story behind the painting and kind of describe it? Cause it's an audio <laughs> version of this podcast. So I'm looking at this painting oh. behind Sarah that are these beautiful colors and it looks like a Southwest kind of sunset thing. And there's this perfect cactus and he's got a mustache and it's adorable and it's beautiful. And so if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. If you're seeing it, if you're listening on audio, go, go to the YouTube channel and check out this painting. But tell, tell us a little bit about how this painting happened. And cause that's part of your creativity. It's part of who you are. And I think it's beautiful. Okay. And that, it is funny. So in the 80s, growing up in the 80s, I kept seeing these, these I don't know what you would call them, but these knit circles of a depiction of a sunset. And they were usually in these colors, or I would see a painting of a depiction of a sunset, and it was usually in these colors. I'm from Western New York. When the sunset it sets, it does not look like this. And I thought growing up that, oh, it cannot possibly be that. It does not actually get that purple and red and blue. That's crazy. Then I moved to Arizona, and that's when I started watching the sunsets and the way that the light refracts off the mountains. And by the way, the mountains are what turns purple in the sunset with that hue of blue just over the mountains, right as the sun is setting. And then those various colors that come above that. And I I was like, I have to paint this. I have to do my parody of what I thought was, was non-existent growing up. And of course you had to put in the saguaro cactus and I thought it was missing something. So uh, and it, to me, it was missing that little bit of humor that I like to inject in everything. So cactus with a mustache. I love it. A little it. bit and of a handlebar mustache. Yes, yeah, and the handlebar mustache is, it gets it all, puts it all together. But the first time I saw a sunset, because I was raised on the west coast of Florida, so all of my sunsets were over the Gulf, which was just spectacular and just beautiful. One of my musicians used to say they're surround sound sunsets. Like you just, you can look back, you can look everywhere and they're beautiful. And the first time I saw a sunset over mountains and it was out in Arizona, I noticed how purple they got and the, the blue above it. And I thought it was so majesty, beauty. I could understand some of the songs about it and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this is different than the water and it's equally as cool. It's not yeah. one wasn't better than the other, but it was so majestic and so beautiful. And the purple was, and purple is my favorite color. So I was like, whoa, baby, I've been missing this. I am glad I get to see this now. And, and it's just breathtaking to give ourselves permission to step into something totally new and go experience it. Yeah, exactly. And I, it, you know, speaking on that, um, I used to say that no matter what happens in Arizona, you always have that sunrise and sunset to look to because no matter what, it's always beautiful every single day. To me, that's like hope and beauty and all, all wrapped into one. So what is your most memorable food you've ever eaten? <laughs> wow, that's a fun one. Most memorable <laughs> food. Mm-hmm. I reluctantly tried a frog leg in St. Lucia at a French restaurant in St. Lucia. And this frog leg was about the size of my forearm. And they put it down in front of me. It was like one leg. 
And I just, I just busted out laughing because I'm like, what fro- are there frogs in the world that are this big? And yes, by the way, it does taste just like chicken, like a light version of chicken. But it was the size of that frog leg and imagining how big that frog is. And then also the, the hurt and the pain that I felt because I realized that a frog had to die in order for me to eat that. Mm-hmm. And that was it. So for me, that was the most memorable because it really, that really made it, a, that was when I crossed over the line of, okay, I'm not really into meat or anything that, that has that type of life. I even have a hard time cutting plants sometimes because it, it breaks my heart to think that they're being hurt. Yeah. So that was the most memorable thing I've eaten uh, wow. because it was life-changing for me. Yes. Oh, yes. I had I had somebody that I was working with recently who went diving in South America, and he's like, he goes, I could feel the essence of the fish that we caught that he was eating afterwards because I could feel the essence and he won't touch it anymore. Yeah. He won't do it. Yeah. He says, I just can't. And that's that deep, intuitive connection to sentient beings beyond yeah. just human prefrontal cortex connection. Right. So, so is there anything that you wanted to talk about today that I haven't asked you about or anything on your heart that you would love to share with everybody? I have a final question, but I want to make sure first that all that you would like to share or that's coming to you intuitively or mentally that you would like to share is said. You know, the one message that I really, it's been driving home for me and, the, and I think is going to be my message for 2022 is trust yourself because that's how you learn to trust your intuition knowing that that first answer that comes up, even though you might not like it, is the answer. And to trust in that and to take that step, that leap of faith, whatever you want to call it. Indiana Jones comes to mind with the, with the steps appearing. <laughs> but that, knowing that, that trusting yourself and when you take that step, the ground will be there. The platform will be there. Just do it and watch your life change. Once you, once you commit to trusting yourself, your life will start to become better. You, your life will start to change. And again, that is the first step of understanding and trusting your intuition is trusting yourself because you are your intuition. Yes. It's your brain that's putting those words on there saying, oh no, maybe it might not be that. So do that. And that, if, if anything, that's my message to the world for 2022. That's great. And so intuition's not all woo-woo. It, it can, it go, it's the highest form of intelligence. And so it, it is not what a lot of people think it is. And when you combine it with trust and openness and awareness, and you start paying attention and verifying and confirming what you're getting, then it's a whole, it's a game changer. It's a total game changer. So are you familiar with heart math? Oh, yes. Okay. So that's what people should know there. Because again, the person that has to know how this works wait, how does intuition work? How does this? I got into heart math and now I'm an advocate. I'm, I'm, my goal is to, by the end of 2023, become an instructor so that I can teach people intuition. Because for years I kept asking, how do, how do I teach this? How do I show other people how to do what I do? And it's, other, it's more than just trusting yourself. And how do you do that? And that's incorporating some of that science, which I love because you can explain, well, this is really what's happening physically. So it's not just woo. But here's some science behind it. Yes, absolutely. I've been I've been teaching people how to develop and use their intuition now for 40 years or something. And that's what I do most of the time. And and I use a lot of heart math science and have like when they first started really coming out with it years ago before anybody really knew who they were. I'm like, oh, I love you guys. I love you. You know, because they, right. were, they were bringing forth science that I already intuitively knew was true. But now right. I had science to go with what I already knew. And I, it was just, I just love it. And I, and I work with some neuroscientists now. And so we talk a lot about science and neuroscience and research and bringing it to the people and how do you apply it and all of these different things that a lot of people don't realize what we have to go, what steps happen in the science world in order to bring it out. And then they'll ask me and I'll go, well, that's, yeah, that's good. Or that's this. And it's really, really great dialogue to bring it all together. So I like to tell everybody it's a yes. And, you know, don't rule out all these beautiful facets of who you are as you go into technology or engineering or a science or, or anywhere or music, or it doesn't matter. Bring it all, bring all of you there because that's where the beauty is. So to add one thing to that, I think it would be fun. And if I ever get the invitation to do so, you are coming with me. So there's the magnetometer, which can measure, measure the energy that we emit from our bodies. Mm-hmm. And I would love to get in front of a magnetometer and play with it. If, as long as it's safe health-wise, I'm not sure on that, but there's that technology behind it. I'm like, I wonder if we can you know, increase and dial down our heart 
emittance, our heart energy, and have that show up on the magnetometer. So that would be we'll really definitely fun. get a call. We're going. We're going on a field trip. <laughs> you know, I know I can feel it. I can feel that I can do it, but I would love to see the reflection of me doing it. Like yeah. how that is. That'd be wonderful. Okay. So your last question of the interview, because we are about to go down another rabbit hole that could be a whole nother interview. Um, is there's a billboard we're putting up that the entire world is going to see with your personal message on it. What is that billboard? Oh, that's an interesting one. That's funny you say that because I, I, I have this dream of putting a billboard up and it might be for spiteful reasons, but I have a dream of putting a billboard up with just my face on it to show people that I've made it despite the things that have happened in my life. I've had, I have a very interesting backstory of how I got to where I am today, but just to put that out there and to see the people that, that poo pooed me, the people that did not believe in me, the people that thought that that was my demise and to see, no, I came back out and I'm stronger because of that. That led me to where I wanted to go. And I am happy that it happened. Nobody says they're happy that they're hacked. I'm happy I was hacked. I can have a conversation about cybersecurity on all levels because of that. So my billboard might just be my face with a big smile. But if there was a message, it would still be trust yourself, trust Trust the process, but trust yourself. Trust yourself. I love it. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the Someone Gets Me podcast with me today. This conversation has been amazing. I have goosebumps and I'm certain I'll have you back on the show because we have more to talk about. Oh, yeah. Please do, because we can talk about we have, we have even covered the nonprofit world. Right. We have so there is so much more. So remember, everybody, to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and let your beautiful light shine and be that beneficial presence you're meant to be. Until the next episode, if someone gets me, be well.